Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Kościuszko Foundation's webinar, Beyond the Battle of Warsaw, the Polish-Soviet War of 1919-1920 in Western Geopolitics by Dr. Piotr Puchalski. My name is Eva Zadborna. I'm Director of Cultural Affairs at the Foundation, and I want to thank you for taking time out and joining us here today, which happens to be our first webinar after the summer break. At the beginning, I want to say that we'll be running a live Q&A at the end of the webinar. So if you'd like to ask a question, please do so using Q&A feature. Also, please note that this lecture is being recorded and will be posted on the Foundation's YouTube channel. As you know, this month marks the 100th anniversary of one of the most decisive events in Poland's history. A hundred years ago, in August 1920, a young Polish Republic that just regained its independence after 123 years of being erased from the political map of Europe, stopped Soviet expansion into Western Europe. The battle that took place on the outskirts of Warsaw, this young Polish Republic was not supposed to have won. And if Poland had not succeeded, it's very possible that European history would have taken a completely different turn. Vladimir Lenin, the Bolshevik leader, called it an enormous defeat, and British politician, diplomat, and author Edgar Vincent Dabernon named it the 18th most decisive battle in world history. Much has been recently said, written, and presented about the Battle of Warsaw, known as the Miracle of the Vistula. Its anniversary was also noted in the U.S. House of Representatives. Today, in this webinar, we'd like to present this historic event in, this, in its larger geopolitical context. It is my pleasure to introduce to you our guest speaker, who specializes in diplomatic and political history of the interwar period, Dr. Piotr Puharski. Dr. Puchalski holds his doctoral degree in modern European history from University of Wisconsin-Madison. During his studies, he conducted dissertation research on the interwar Poland at Stanford University's Hoover Institution, where he was a Silas Palmer Research Fellow. Earlier, he earned bachelor degree in European studies and French from New York University. Originally, he is from Warsaw, and now he works as an assistant professor of modern European history at the Pedagogical University in Krakow, Poland. In his upcoming book, he analyzes the role played by colonial aspirations in the formation and development of the interwar Polish state. Dr. Puchalski, thank you very much for accepting our invitation to give this talk here today. Um, and uh, now let me uh, give this virtual floor, or rather I should say screen, to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for this wonderful and generous introduction, Eva. And thank you to the Kosciuszko Foundation for giving me the honor to, um, to give a talk on this uh, grand historical centennial, the Battle of Warsaw. Uh, in fact, the Soviet-Polish uh, War of 1919-1920 has a great connection to the Kosciuszko Foundation. Um, which um, I made sure to include in this um, little lecture of mine. So um, bear that in mind as you, as you listen to me um, narrate this fascinating story from a slightly different perspective than um, is usually done. Um, so I'm not quite used to giving online lectures, um, but I think that I will do what I usually um, do, which is to share a PowerPoint with the audience. So let me see if that works out. As the title of my talk suggests, today I will focus on the more neglected dimension of the Battle of Warsaw, uh, namely its role in Western geopolitics. In other words, I will examine Western geopolitical approaches to the great struggle between the newly independent Poland under Józef Piłsudski and the new communist Russia under Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, also known as Lenin. In this respect, I hope that my distinguished audience will forgive me if I don't spend too much time uh, brooding over meetings of the general staff of the Polish army. Instead, um, I hope that my, um, instead I would like to take you on a brief journey through the quarters um, of the White House, the Kedel Se, um, and Whitehall, filled by cigar smoke of American, French, and 
British diplomats. And as you know, these metonyms are, of course, used to describe the foreign ministries of the United States, France, and Britain, respectively. Uh, but as I will show, uh, they also reference specific ways of viewing the world and its geopolitics. My focus on diplomacy does not mean that I will neglect to offer an overview of the most important facts related to the Polish Bolshevik War. In fact, in the first part of this presentation, I will narrate uh, the rudimentary political and military history of the Battle of Warsaw. But, and I underline this, it's also my desire to unveil the less often discussed Western attitudes towards the Polish Soviet War, as, or as you may, the Polish Bolshevik War. And in preparing this talk, I have drawn information from my own research, um, but also from works on, of, of, of other Polish historians. Um, and here I need to underline the names of Andrzej Nowak, Jerzy Bożenski, and Mariusz Boz. And it's my sincere hope that um, um, by sharing with you their findings, I can also bring their wonderful research closer to you, to the American public. Um, when a historian starts a lecture lesson or really any talk uh, on any topic, the looming question always becomes when the narrative should begin. After all, how far back in time is the sequence of cause and effects still relevant? How much does it matter what happened in the 18th or 19th century for what happened in the 20th? In the case of the Polish-Soviet War, the question of when it began automatically sets the stage for yet another question, namely which sides started the conflict? Was it the Poles or was it the Bolsheviks? Was it the Bolshevik attack on Vilnius or as the Poles would say Vilno in April 1919? Or was it, or rather in January, uh, or was it the Polish offensive on Kiev or as the Ukrainians would say Kiev in April 1920? In many ways, the historiographical argument over such periodization reflects different ways of viewing the collapse of the Russian Empire and the resurrection of Poland in the late 1910s. Which state or nation was entitled to claim the westernmost territory of the extinct domains of the Tsars? Was it only Bolshevik Russia? How far east could resurrected Poland expand, if at all? What about the other nationalities in the region, Lithuanians, Ukrainians? Finally, was the Polish-Bolshevik clash a feature of the Russian Civil War? Or was it an extension to what a German historian, um, Jochen Beller, has recently called the Polish Civil War? So to address these questions, let's start with 1960, the year of the greatest German military successes on the Eastern Front of World War I. As you might know, the Great War of 1919-1918 was the first major conflict that pitted the powers which had partitioned the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth against one another. The outbreak of the Great War encouraged Polish patriots, such as Józef Piłsudski, Roman Dmowski, Ignacy Paderewski, to place their bets on, uh, for Polish independence on either the Central Powers or the Entente. By the end of 1916, it was the Central Powers that conquered all of the former Russian partition, and with the act of November 5th, created a puppet Polish state called the Kingdom of Poland. The state was run by a German governor, which nevertheless uh, granted a high degree of autonomy, in domestic affairs at least, to the local Polish administration. And this was the first time in a century uh, that the possibility of at least a semi-independent Poland emerged as the Germans prepared the ground for a new order in the former Russian territory of Central Europe. And the Germans um, would call this region Mittel Europa. So of course, this was the region of influence or supposed to be, uh, but again, this semi-independent uh, Kingdom of Poland was uh, quite a breakthrough. And in this map, uh, you can see the extent of German conquest um, by 1916 in the gray color. So you see this miniature Kingdom of Poland, you see to the east of it, Belarusia, Ukraine, to the northeast, Lithuania, and the other two Baltic states. Um, 
with the creation of this autonomous German sponsored uh, kingdom of Poland, Pandora's box is opened and the so-called Polish question can no longer disappear from the Western geopolitical agenda. In cities such as Paris and St. Petersburg, Dmowski and other right-wingers form the Polish National Committee to lobby the Entente to support the creation of an independent Polish state after defeating the central powers. Until late 1917, however, the committee's appeals are largely swept under the carpet. After all, the British leader David Lloyd George and French leader Georges Clemenceau are aware that promising independence to Poland will lead to a conflict with Russia, their only ally in the East. The situation changes in February, March 1917, depending on which calendar you follow, as Russia's Tsarist regime is abolished and the new provisional government makes its own promises of Polish autonomy in the hope of swaying more Poles to Russia's side. And still, the West remains rather unmoved regarding the question of full-fledged Polish independence, unwilling to allow Poland much more than mere autonomy within its so-called ethnographic borders, that is within the Kingdom of Poland, which you can see on the screen, hopefully. Um, these were the only Polish boundaries that seemed uncontroversial to the Western powers. And of course, uh, uh, you can see that uh, within this kingdom, uh, not even Białystok was included, or uh, um, not to speak of territories further to the east, um, including the city of Lwów or Lemberg, right? Uh, but then, of course, comes uh, October or November um, 1917, again, depending on which calendar you follow, and Lenin's coup d'etat at the Winter Palace. In other words, the Bolshevik takeover is on the way. We will come back to the Western um, perceptions of the new Soviet regime in Russia, but for now, um, it suffices to say that Western leaders considered it a nuisance, especially as Lenin uh, decides to publish copies of secret treaties that his men discover in Tsarist archives. One of such treaties, um, you might recall, was the infamous Sykes-Picot uh, Sykes Agreement to divide the Middle East into British and French spheres of influence. This was, of course, done behind the back of Arab leaders such as King Faisal. Um, if you ever uh, saw the movie The Lawrence of Arabia, um, the Arab disappointment that treaty is greatly shown um, in that movie. But let's return to the Polish question. Uh, partly in response to Lenin's uh, so-called new diplomacy, on January 8th, 1918, Woodrow Wilson proclaims his 14 points. As you know, the penultimate, um, second to last of the points, promises the creation of an autonomous Polish state guaranteed a free access uh, to the sea, to the Baltic Sea. But you might also know that this does not necessarily mean a completely independent, sovereign Poland, nor does it suggest that any Polish gains at the expense of Russia beyond the miniature kingdom of Poland. Instead, there is this continued Western unwillingness to alienate any Russia, white or red. Uh, this hesitance is apparent in the fact that the Entente only publishes its war aims, including the goal of establishing an independent Poland, in March 1918. And this, of course, coincides with the signing of the Brest Litovsk armistice between the German and Soviet troops, which effectively takes Russia out of World War I. In this way, for at least a moment, uh, Russia ceases to be an ally of the Entente, which makes the latter open to Polish independence and the Wilsonian idea of national self determination more broadly. And of course, national self-determination would apply only to Eastern Europe, not to Africa, not to Asia, just to keep that clear. So keep this interdependence in mind. Um, the Western powers only need an independent Poland if Russia does not seem to be a reliable ally. Okay. So finally comes the Polish independence. Contrary to common knowledge, Poland's independence from the Germans is declared on October 7th, 1918, by the Regency Council in Warsaw. What takes, pla what takes place on November 11th, 1918, um, is that amid the armistice and abdication of the Habsburg Emperor, the Regency Council transfers power to Józef Piłsudski. Piłsudski thus becomes the head of a state 
that encompasses the Kingdom of Poland and effectively also the western part of the former Habsburg province of Galicia, the Austrian partition. Moreover, in, 19, um, in December 1918 um, and early 1919, a successful Polish uprising breaks out in Greater Poland, the Poznań region, against the Germans. Under the political leadership of Wojciech Korfanty and military leadership of General Józef Dowbor Muśnicki. Still, Piłsudski wishes, as most Polish leaders at the time, to expand the borders of this nascent state in the eastern direction towards cities and areas with significant, if not majority, Polish populations. Eastern Galicia, with the Polish speaking capital of Lwów or Lemberg or Lviv, uh, becomes the arena of internecine conflict between former Polish and Ukrainian Habsburg subjects. And you can see a map of Galicia on the screen uh, with the purple line roughly being today's um, border between Poland and Ukraine. Uh, by April 1919, um, with the help of General Józef Haller's Blue Army, equipped and trained by the French, the Polish state prevails against the West Ukrainian People's Republic. Um, two months later, um, on June 18, 1919, the Entente grants Poland a temporary mandate of the right to rule over Eastern Galicia, which is extended for an undefined period of time at the end of the year. So keep this in mind, the Western powers do accept the Polish victory against the Ukrainians. They accept um, the Polish authority to rule Eastern Galicia by the end of 1919. Um, at the same time, in the northeastern Lithuania and Belarus, the first skirmishes between the Polish army and the Red Army occur. And this is finally when we get to the Polish-Soviet War. Sorry if this introduction was quite lengthy. Um, while Piłsudski wishes to incorporate Eastern Galicia directly into Poland, his plan for the territories of the former Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth beyond the Niemen at the, at, and the Dnieper rivers is different. There is supposed to be an independent Lithuania and an independent Ukraine, as long as it's to the east of the Lvov region, uh, maybe even an independent Belarus in some form of federation with Poland. So, um, of course, his famous Intermarium um, Confederation plan. By 1919, however, the Bolsheviks begin to reconquer the western borderlands of the former Tsardom, while simultaneously combating the white generals Alexander Kolchak in Siberia and Anton Denikin in eastern Ukraine. The Soviet reconquest is facilitated by the retreating German army um, coming from the wartime German occupation zone known as the Oberost, uh, which consisted roughly of Lithuania and Belarus. Um, and German officers preferred to surrender to the Russians, to the Bolsheviks, rather than to Poles. In the winter of 1919, Soviet Russia, actually let's go back to this slide, um, by, by winter 1919, Soviet Russia occupies most of northeastern Europe, including Vilnius, the historic capital of Lithuania, which was, of course, Piłsudski's beloved city because he was born nearby. Um, why, you might ask, is Soviet Russia launching this offensive in the Northeast? They, they have to worry about the white generals, right? Alexander Kolchak, Anton Denikin, why are they launching this new offensive? Well, um, we have already said that Piłsudski wanted to create his confederation. Well, the top Soviet leadership, which consisted at the time of Lenin, Stalin, Lev Kamenev, um, and Trotsky, they aimed to form a territorial bridge to Germany, which they considered the world's intellectual and cultural capital of communism, from where the world revolution uh, could be spread even further to the West, in all the geographical directions, really. We might therefore say that this Polish-Soviet war begins rather organically as the German retreat in Northeastern Europe leave, leaves um, a power vacuum in which Polish geo geopolitical designs clash with their Soviet counterparts. So this is really a natural outcome of 
these um, rival geopolitical um, plans. And as you can see on this map, quickly the tide of the conflict turns in Poland's favor. As in March and April um, of 1919, a Polish counteroffensive takes place in Lithuania and Belarus, with the cities of uh, Pinsk, Lida, and finally Vilnius captured from the Red Army. Minsk is taken by August, while in October, Polish troops reach as far as southern Latvia. In mid-October, however, Piłsudski stops his troops at the Latvian city of Dineburg and allows officers Michał Kosakowski and Ignacy Berner to negotiate with the Polish-speaking Soviet representative, and his name was Julian Marchlewski. And this takes place in the town of Michaszewice. I believe you can see this town on the map, on the map here, somewhere um, along the black line. Um, the series of Polish-Soviet negotiations, which are broken off on November 13, um, have become the stuff of conspiracy theories, frankly according to which Piłsudski purposely agrees to halt his offensive in order to allow the Bolsheviks to um, finish off Denikin in eastern Ukraine. So um, this is considered Piłsudski's appeasement of the Bolsheviks or uh, betrayal of, 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 of the white generals. But the upcoming Russian winter and Polish financial problems seem to have played a large role in um, encouraging Piłsudski to take that decision, to make that decision. And the Red Army at the time outnumbers both um, Piłsudski and Denikin's forces combined three to one. So uh, we should keep that in mind. All right, so perhaps now is, this good, is a good time to transition to the main topic of this presentation, uh, mainly the role played by this rapidly developing Polish-Soviet conflict in Western geopolitics. Uh, let's begin with the United States and the attitude of the Wilson administration. So it's often assumed and even taken for granted that Americans being staunch capitalists opposed Bolshevism from the start. And this opinion, of course, finds an echo in the story of the American pilots who volunteered to fight alongside Poland and formed the, the Polish 7th Air Escadrille, also known as the Kościuszko Squadron. Among them was Cedric Fontleroy, born in Natchez, Mississippi, and named after, after a late 19th century romantic novel, Little Lord Fontleroy, just as a fun anecdote. Uh, Fontleroy was recruited to the Polish-American unit in the making by a Jacksonville, Florida native named Miriam C. Cooper. And you can see both gentlemen on the screen. Both um, Fontleroy and Cooper had been pilots in World War I, and would be awarded the highest Polish decoration, the Virtuti Militari, for their exploits against the armies of Tukhachevsky and Budionne. And my listeners should also take note that Fontleroy became one of the founders of the Kościuszko Foundation in 1925, while Cooper became an aviation pioneer um, and produced the famous uh, movie King Kong in 1933. Um, so here is the connection to the Kościuszko Foundation uh, that I had mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Um, and yet, as Fontelroy and Cooper and many other Americans joined the Polish effort, the Wilson administration was at least ambivalent about supporting Piłsudski with money, not to speak of materiel. Wilson, whom you can see on the screen, um, and his secretaries of state, first Robert Lansing, and then Bainbridge Colby found communism to be a godless and anti-human ideology. Nevertheless, the Americans also believed that Bolshevism was an understandable result of oppressive Tsarist rule and therefore legitimate, at least for the time being. No, not yet. Um, therefore, America could only fight Bolshevism with economic and moral means. And it was the Russian nation itself that needed to install a less oppressive regime. As you might guess, this peculiar ideological argument was not the only reason for the hands of attitude toward the Soviets. The other reason was the fear that Russia, white or red, would ally with Germany and destroy the Versailles system that was so difficult to build in the first place. Um, the idea was that Russia would ally with Germany if, if of course, Russia 
uh, too much territory is taken from Russia, right? Uh, to the benefit of Poland. Uh, for this reason, only a small Poland, acceptable to most Russians, should be supported by the United States. Moreover, Wilson did not envision the possibility of small states, quote unquote small states, determining their own fate. Instead, Wilsonianism was a system of great power politics, um, let's say sugar-coated in the language of internationalism, where small states were simply to listen to the world's policemen. Of course, uh, the leading one of them being the United States. Um, moreover, it was also American economic interests um, that encouraged Wilson, Lansing, um, and Colby to avoid alienating Red Russia given that the country was an immense export market. Instead, a couple of years, um, indeed, indeed, a couple of uh, years later, um, under Mikhail Bukharin's new economic policy, Russia will welcome investments by US companies such as Harvester and International General Electric. Uh, so this uh, US-Russian cooperation and the economic sphere comes to uh, fruition very soon. Um, Another reason for this U.S. attitude toward Poland um, was that just as 20 years later, under FDR, Franklin D. Roosevelt, Wilson's America was full of Russian propagandists, including American socialist named John Spargo. Um, according to Spargo, Bolsheviks were mere radicals who wished to preserve Russia's greatness amid the disaster of World War I. So he uh, depicted Bolsheviks almost as some form of nationalists. Um, and with the Soviets on the outskirts of Warsaw in August 1920, Secretary of State Kolbe was inspired by Spargo to identify any Polish expansion east of the Bug River, um, so into Eastern Galicia, as, quote, imperialism. Even though Eastern Galicia never belonged to Russia, and was inhabited by Poles and Ukrainians. It had been a Habsburg province. It did not belong to Russia. But to be fair, it was still Kolbe who tried to send an American ship to Gdańsk or Danzig uh, to protect American interests during the German blockade of Polish shipments. And for this, um, Wilson strongly admonished Kolbe, arguing that Bolshevism would, quote, burn itself out on its own, um, and for that reason, America should not intervene on Poland's behalf. Um, why was Wilson not even willing to save ethnic, non-imperialist Poland from the Bolsheviks? Why was it? Well, there was certainly a degree of disillusionment with European affairs behind this approach. You might recall that in March 1920, the Republican-controlled Senate refused to ratify the Versailles Treaty. And the Versailles Treaty was, of course, uh, Wilson's political child um, and a sign of his unfulfilled legacy. Wilson's powerlessness and bitterness, um, certainly caused by this failure, was clear in his letter to British Prime Minister Lloyd George, uh, written already in November 1920, so after the Battle of Warsaw. And Wilson wrote, quote, I believe we are in substantial accord as to the folly of the Poles. I have been fearful that their enthusiasm following temporary military successes may lead to insistence upon territorial arrangements, which will be a source of trouble in the future. So you can tell that according to Wilson, Poland was just a source of trouble and its territorial aspirations should be kept to an absolute minimum. Um, as to not alienate um, Russia from, from the West. Um, so in summary, when it came to the United States, Poland suffered not only from this peculiar initial American approach to Bolshevism, but also from Wilson's personal foibles. And in this way, we transition to um, the French attitude toward independent Poland. Um, which is important to explain given that Warsaw is often described as Paris's client state in 1920. Uh, we all heard of uh, the French military mission to Warsaw in August. Um, so I, I, I do think it's, it's worth elaborating on this, this French attitude. 
Uh, so the idea that Poland was a French client was in fact far from the truth. Although the French did attempt to make instrumental use of the Poles. At first sight, the French support for Poland might seem perfectly obvious. After all, following the German-Soviet armistice of Brest-Litovsk in March 1918, the French need a substitute ally in the East to keep the defeated Germany in check. And moreover, independent Poland um, was desirable as a central element in the French anti-Soviet scheme called Cordon Sanitaire, a term first coined in this context by Georges Clemenceau, whom you see on the screen, in March 1919. Cordon Sanitaire was supposed to be a chain of buffer states between Germany and Soviet Russia that was supposed to contain the spread of communism from the latter to the former. Uh, moreover, the French had invested large sums, and perhaps this is the key point, in Russia prior to 1914. Uh, and these funds, the, the, this money, these investments were now lost as the Bolsheviks confiscated foreign assets. Uh, logically, French industrialists pressured Clemenceau to intervene in the ongoing Russian civil war on behalf of the whites. In the hope that a white Russia reemerges, however, the French leadership did not wish for Poland to acquire too much territory in the East. So the French needed to balance between um, fighting the Reds um, and supporting uh, Poland against the Reds as well. So the ideal situation for the French was um, one in which Poland maintained a stable border with Soviet Russia, preventing it from uh, spreading, from preventing communism from spreading to the West. Um, and the French also wished for Poland to uh, support uh, Anton Denikin in Crimea. Uh, but they did not want, uh, they didn't want Poland to, uh, to expand to the East because again, that would antagonize Denikin who um, believed that um, all of Ukraine was uh, basically Russian territory. Um, so otherwise in 1919 and early 1920, Paris tried to distribute its support between Piłsudski and Denikin, needing the former to keep Germany in check and to assist the latter in toppling the Bolshevik regime. Um, this geopolitical strategy of the French uh, begins to change in late 1919, as the gentleman you see on the screen, Alexandre, Alexandre Millerand, excuse my French, replaces Clemenceau as prime minister. Millerand followed Clemenceau's po policies and being himself a former socialist, um, was even more anti-communist than his predecessor. Despite this, um, the changing geopolitical situation around the world gradually distracts the French from Eastern Europe. Um, two events in particular bear um, responsibility for, for this destruction, for distracting the French uh, from the region um, most crucial to the Polish Soviet War, Eastern Europe. In March 1920, two revisionist German right wingers named Wolfgang Kapp and Walter von Ludwitz, stage a putsch in Berlin, um, which in turn encourages a communist uprising uh, to break out in the Rhineland. The left-wing German government manages to put down both the putsch and the communist uprising. But the problem is that, as you might recall from your history lessons, the Rhineland was a demilitarized zone after World War I, and this causes the French to intervene, and it increases uh, German-French tensions in general. In the second place, um, we go back to the Middle East now, um, France was also engaged in fighting the Arab troops under the leadership of Prince Faisal in Syria in order to prevent a united Hashemite kingdom from emerging. Um, so March 1920 um, was certainly an eventful um, um, month because it was also the month in which the Entente troops moved into Constantinople to keep the Turks down, the defeated Turks. Uh, so in this way, um, despite being positively disposed toward the Polish side in the conflict with the Soviets, the Milleron is simply not uh, ready to embrace the new offensive launched by Piłsudski in April 1920. 
And this allows the British, whom we haven't talked about yet, to take a leadership role in determining the Western response to the Polish-Soviet conflict. And this will be to Poland's detriment, as you will see. So before we tackle the British, um, let's briefly talk about this Polish offensive. You should note that in early 1920, Piłsudski was not content with the Polish troops only occupying most of Lithuania and Belarus. His aim was much broader um, and included Ukraine, which was supposed to emerge as an independent state allied with Poland within this larger intermarium uh, confederation. Um, Despite Haller's Blue Army having crushed West Ukrainians a year before, Piłsudski became comfortable with a certain Simon Petlura. Uh, and you can see both Piłsudski and Petlura in the photograph shown on the screen. Piłsudski, of course, on the left, Petlura on the right, center stage. Uh, so Petlura was an Eastern Ukrainian leader whose ambition was to create a Ukrainian state around the Dnieper River with a capital at Kiev. So not Lvov, Kiev. And this was, of course, um, good for Piłsudski. In late 1919, Petlura was in control of a thin strip of land that served as a buffer zone between the Poles and Anton Denikin's forces, um, which were fighting um, the Bolsheviks around Kiev. Um, and thus begins the British legend of Polish imperialism in Eastern Europe. Um, because you all know what happens. Piłsudski launches an offensive against Kiev. And this, to, uh, and this legend to this day functions as the backbone of the theory that it was Poland that started the war with Soviet Russia in 1920, not in 1919, mind you. But we know that in fact, the term Polish imperialism begins to function in British diplomatic circles as early as 1919, so well before Piłsudski's offensive. Um, and this, this term, Polish imperialism, reflects the views of the liberal British prime minister, whom we've already mentioned, but let's mention him again, um, shown on the picture. This is, of course, um, David Lloyd George. Um, Polish historian Andrzej Nowak has written an entire book about the factors that encouraged Lloyd George and his two secretaries, Philip Kerr and Morris Honky, to assume an extremely negative view of Polish foreign policy. For uh, the sake of saving some time, uh, let me mention just a couple of these factors without getting lost in the details. Uh, I'm not sure how we're doing on time, but... Uh, uh, but let me, let me maybe not delve into too many details. Uh, so in the first place, um, Lloyd George's worldview was shaped by something that we might call a British imperial optic or imperial gaze. Now, we already mentioned that even an idealist such as Wilson considered national self-determination as a desirable phenomenon but only insofar as it was supervised by the wiser and more civilized policemen of the world, namely the great European powers. So of course it wasn't really self-determination, it was determination by the great powers. Uh, Lloyd George in turn, in contrast to Wilson, was not even concerned with a semblance of giving a voice to the so-called small nations if their aspirations, including the justified ones, contradicted his grand designs for arranging the world. For the British leader, especially after the carnage of World War I, the highest value was peace. How he defined peace remained to be seen, but uh, he claimed that it was about peace. And he believed, Lloyd George did, that only by appeasing the Russians, white or red, with as much former Tsarist territory as possible, could Russia be prevented from joining Germany and challenging the Versailles order. So as opposed to the French, uh, the British believe that um, Russia and Germany would not uh, form an alliance, that they would actually maintain order in Eastern Europe. Um, Poland was only a nuisance in this configuration and Britain, accrediting itself uh, for creating the Polish state in the first place could freely dispense with its Eastern territory. 
But of course, uh, we would be naive to think that it was only desire for quote unquote peace that was behind the British appeasement of Soviet Russia. This appeasement was also about British imperial interests. Already in 1916, Lord Balfour, um, you might um, know his name from the Balfour Declaration about Palestine. Already in 1916, Lord Balfour feared that Poland's role um, as a buffer state between Russia and Germany would allow either empire to expand in the colonies, which would of course be detrimental to British interests. Balfour's successor as the nominal head of the foreign office, Lord Curzon, likewise worried about Soviet influence in Central Asia and Afghanistan. Uh, by 1920, Lloyd George was able to persuade Curzon, himself in favor of aiding Poland, to believe that sacrificing Eastern Europe would appease Russia in Asia. Um, to be fair, not all British leaders thought this way. Uh, critics of Lloyd George's pro-Russian strategy pointed out that without a series of strong buffer states, there was a danger of Germany forming a common front with Russia in both Europe and in the colonies. And we need to mention two figures here, two very important figures, critics of um, Lloyd George's um, geopolitical strategy. The first one of them is Halford Mackinder, the father of geopolitics itself, of the field of geopolitics. Uh, Mackinder feared that Germany and Russia would form one geopolitical unit in Eurasia called the heartland, which not even a maritime empire such as Britain would be able to oppose in the future. So again, to uh, recapitulate, David Lloyd George thought that alliance between Germany and Russia was, was good because these powers would maintain order in Eastern Europe. Halford Mackinder believed that this alliance would be disastrous for the British Empire because the British could not keep this, um, this, this great Eurasian power in check. Um, in addition, Winston Churchill, you all know Winston Churchill, um, at the time, the Minister of War, personally conflicted with Lloyd George, understood uh, well that the Bolsheviks intended to spread their communist ideology and that they would not stop at Warsaw. So Churchill was, um, on the other hand, concerned with ideology, with communism um, infecting Western Europe if the Poles were not um, aided in, in stopping uh, the Bolsheviks. And yet beyond geopolitics, uh, there was yet another reason for Lloyd George's anti-Polish sentiment. And this was the domestic pressure against his government in Britain itself. In the first place, the liberals from his party expected Britain to resume trade with the large market that was Russia, sounds familiar? Uh, and they floated the idea that Ukraine, in particular, was the breadbasket of Europe. In an infamous memorandum that exaggerated the importance of Russian trade, expert Edward Weiss assumed, in effect, that Ukraine was essentially just the province of Russia. And as a side note, I must say that this was quite an ironic memorandum. Uh, to be written at a time that Kiev was captured from the Russians by a joint Polish-Ukrainian force. And lastly, um, there was also genuine sympathy for the Soviet experiment among British left-wing groups and the Labour Party, which believed that the Bolsheviks should be given a chance to govern. By August 1920, strikes erupted all over Britain and British dockers refused to load ships, even those carrying food destined for Poland. So some of you might have heard the story of German doctors in Gdansk, Danzig um, refusing to, to load ships uh, for the Poles. Well, this was also the case in Britain, out of all places. All right, so now that I've outlined why Lloyd George rooted for a Soviet triumph against Poland, let me also briefly outline his actions, all right? So Lloyd George's diplomatic tactic was to force Poland to sign a peace treaty with the Soviets under unfavorable terms, according to which it would have to surrender as much Eastern territory to the new Russia as possible. Um, and despite the fact that the Polish army had not yet withdrawn from Ukraine, 
uh, London hosted a Soviet delegation with a representative from Moscow uh, named Leonin Krasin um, arriving on May 27th. Um, keep in mind that the Soviet government was not yet internationally recognized. Uh, and the British excuse for hosting a Bolshevik representative was that these were just trade negotiations. Uh, but gradually, um, or rather quickly, not gradually, uh, Lloyd George um, offers Krasin a quote, comprehensive arrangement um, of issues that exist between the two countries. Uh, the British prime minister begins to distance himself from both Piłsudski and the last remaining leader of the whites, Piotr Wrangel, uh, who succeeded Denikin um, in Eastern Ukraine. In mid-June, Lloyd George even promises to stop Piłsudski or Wrangel in exchange for, you guessed it, a stop to Soviet propaganda in Asia. So the British wants to sacrifice Poland for their colonial interests in Asia. Uh, in response to these British overtures, the Soviets draft a letter in which they essentially ask for Eastern Europe to be recognized as their sphere of influence. Um, and Lloyd George accepts this demand and in the face of Soviet troops steadily advancing on Warsaw, he uses the occasion um, of an Entente conference at the Belgian city of Spa to increase pressure on the Polish delegation. And on the screen, you can see a photograph from the Spa conference that took place in July, 1920. Uh, so on July 4th, Lloyd George informs his secretary Carr that he will soon instruct the Poles to ask for British assistance, surrender Vilnius to Lithuania, surrender Cieszyn to Czechoslovakia, surrender Gdańsk to the League of Nations, and surrender Eastern Galicia to Soviet Russia. So Lloyd George tells his secretary this will be the conditions which the Poles will have to agree to if they want any British or Western assistance at all. This is July 4th. Um, and thus we arrive um, at the most important feature of Lloyd George's appeasement of Soviet Russia, let's not be afraid to use the word, namely the A version of the so-called Curzon Line. We all know about the Curzon Line, um, but let's, let's talk about its origins because I think that many people forget what the origins of the Curzon Line um, were. So the Curzon Line, which had two versions, um, was this imagined boundary that separated the supposed ethnic Polish territory from the supposed ethnic Russian territory. Notice not Ukrainian, not Lithuanian, Russian territory. In a note from July 11th, signed by Curzon and addressed to the Soviet Secretary of Foreign Affairs, Georgi Chicherin, uh, the British indicate that they agree to the Soviets annexing all territory east of the Book River, including Eastern Galicia. Um, you have to uh, know that the Polish army at the time is still east of the Curzon Line. Um, and this British note, which is actually edited by Philip Kerr and only signed by Curzon, uh, communicates that the Polish army needs to withdraw to the, uh, to the Curzon line, to the Book River. So, so this, this telegram demands that the Polish army withdraws for no military reason whatsoever, only to fit this uh, British imagination of where this um, boundary between ethnic Poland and ethnic Russia lies. And of course, again, I need to remind uh, my listeners out there that Eastern Galicia had never been Russian territory. It was a province of the Habsburg monarchy. So in order to appease the Soviets, Lloyd George was therefore willing to allow Russia to expand into a region that had never belonged to it. And it's no surprise that the Soviets um, were themselves shocked at being offered this region, which was, by the way, the world's second richest in terms of oil. And the British note um, only encourages the Soviet leadership to intensify their military efforts in Galicia. And still, during the plenary session of the Central Committee, the Soviet leadership rejects the British offer uh, because it is confident that the Red Army will soon conquer all of Poland and continue to Germany. 
at the second Congress of the Third International in Moscow um, in late July. The atmosphere um, is quite exciting. Everybody talks about the impending world revolution, uh, the, the Red Armies on the outskirts of Warsaw. Um, and it also has to be said that um, not only were the Soviets confident they did not need uh, to take this British offer because they would easily conquer Poland, um, it, it has to be said that they also simply don't trust the West. Uh, so just take a look at this poster here, which caricatures the French General Foch and his alleged attempt to mobilize colonial troops against the Bolsheviks. Um, and note the racist depiction of Africans, which indicates uh, that the Soviets were, despite their claims to the contrary, not at all free of racism. They were actually quite racist. And I don't think I need to explain to you why that is. So they don't trust the West. Um, and if you think that after the Soviet rejection of the British note, Lloyd George would finally oppose the Bolsheviks, um, well, you haven't been paying attention. On August 10th, Lloyd George agrees to the Soviet terms as communicated to, uh, by Lev Kamenev. These included, for example, the demilitarization of the Polish army, reducing it to 50,000 soldiers, the establishment of communist civic militias in Poland, and the setting of a Polish-Soviet boundary where the troops happened to be at the time, and of course they happened to be on the outskirts of Warsaw. So Lloyd George agreed to, to, the Soviet, uh, to Soviet Russia basically occupying all of Poland east of Warsaw and even to the north of it. Um, this was outrageous even to the British themselves, apart from Lloyd George. The British envoy to Warsaw, Harris Rambold, stated um, that he was not sure if serving the British government was a job worthy of a gentleman given how London has acted. And even Lloyd George's closest associate, Henry Wilson, not to be confused with uh, Woodrow Wilson, noted that he was shocked at how uh, servile to the Soviets Lloyd George was. Um, so we can, we can talk more about this British appeasement of the Soviets, um, of Soviet Russia in the Q&A, but for now let's come back to the Polish side of the story and I will start to wrap the talk up. Um, you probably wonder already how, despite this great hostility or at best indifference from the West, Poland manages to prevail against Soviet Russia. So as I indicated at the beginning of the talk, I, I don't want to delve too much into the military details of the Polish-Soviet conflict, but it's necessary to state some more facts. So the two armies that penetrate into central Poland in the summer of 1920 are Mikhail Tukhachevsky's army, which attacks Warsaw from the northeast and encircles it, um, as far as um, the western city of Płock. The other army is Semyon Budionny's cavalry army, um, and this army attacks uh, western Galicia from, from eastern Galicia, from Ukraine, and it comes as far as the city of, of Lvov, or Lemberg, or Lviv. Um, in mid-August, Piłsudski, um, however, is able to exploit a sort of miscommunication between Tukhachevsky and Budionny, as well as the fact that Tukhachevsky overextends his lines. Ah, let's keep this slide on. Um, and Piłsudski, noticing this overextension, decides to carry out a counterattack from the Wiepsz River, which you see in the lower part of the map. Uh, the plan was most likely not devised by Piłsudski himself, but by the head of uh, the Polish general staff, General Tadeusz Rozwadowski. And it was probably only selected by Piłsudski from among multiple propositions. Uh, and thanks to this Wiepsz counteroffensive, as it became known, the Poles take tens of thousands of Soviet prisoners and send both Tukhachevsky and Budionny's armies back to the east and even to the north where they get strandel, um, stranded in Prussia. Um, and the Polish chase after the Bolsheviks begins, first on August 31st, at the Battle of Komarów, um, one of the largest cavalry battles in history, by the way, uh, 
uh, the Polish general Juliusz Rumel destroys Budionny's army. And finally, in the second half of September, Piłsudski himself defeats Tukhachevsky to the north um, at the Niemen River um, and soon takes Minsk, um, the capital of Belarus. Uh, the peace negotiations um, had already begun um, at the Latvian capital of Riga. Uh, and now they, of course, turn to Poland's favor and the peace of Riga will be signed in March 1921. But um, essentially, military hostilities ceased by the end of 1920. Okay, so as I bring this talk to a close, uh, let me just make a couple of um, other remarks on the Battle of Warsaw. So first, it has to be said that um, the Soviet advance into Polish territory was marked by violence, especially against the upper social classes, but also against civilians. Um, in the town of Baranowice, for example, the Bolsheviks massacred the patients of a Polish field hospital. Um, but then again, let's be fair, some units of the Polish army were also quite brutal. Um, for example, the riders under the leadership of Felix Jaworski, who struggled against the Bolsheviks and earlier Ukrainian peasants, um, well, let's say it was often less than honorable. And there was also another dark Polish episode during the Battle of Warsaw. On August 16th, um, General Kazimierz Sosinkowski, uh, whom you can see in the picture, um, orders the internment um, of about 3,000 Jewish soldiers at Jabłonna, 70 kilometers south of Warsaw. And formally, these Jews um, in question um, are suspected of allegedly spying for the Bolsheviks, but formally, they're not accused of any crime. So this is very, uh, very strange and uh, smells of, of anti-Semitism, let's be honest. On September 7th, the, the Jews, uh, these Jewish Polish soldiers, they emerge from their arrest well-fed and healthy, but this episode can nevertheless be seen as a sort of foreshadowing of tense Polish-Jewish relations throughout the interwar period. Um, and finally, another remark I would like to make at the end, uh, the Battle of Warsaw should be remembered for the role of the Polish cryptologists um, under uh, the leadership of Jan Kowalewski. Um, so Kowalewski deciphers telegrams from Stalin, who is at the time the political commissar in Budionny's cavalry army, um, as well as other telegrams from other Soviet commanders. And thanks to this information, the Polish intelligence learns about the gap that forms between Budionny and Tukhachevsky and about the personal tensions between the two commanders. And in the following two decades, um, Kowalewski, of course, goes on to become the director of Poland's cipher bureau, Bureau Szyfrów. Um, and thanks to such bright minds as Marian Rejewski, Henryk Zygalski, and Jerzy Ruzicki, the Polish Cypher Bureau is able to crack the German Enigma machine um, until the Germans changed their, um, their ciphering technique in January 1939. But nevertheless, this of course lays the ground for Alan Turing's future work. Okay, so uh, slowly I come to a conclusion here. Um, thank you all for your patience. Um, so it's, it's important to remember the Battle of Warsaw for many reasons. Um, the successes of Polish cryptologists, the military brilliance of the Wiepsch counteroffensive being some of them. Um, the, altogether, these, um, these elements um, uh, led to this great victory that likely stopped communism from, uh, from spreading uh, to Western Europe. And at the same time, what I have tried to demonstrate in this talk is also that by winning the struggle against Soviet Russia for the first time in a couple of um, centuries really, or at least in one century, um, an Eastern um, European nation decides about its own fate on its own terms, despite Western opposition. So thanks to Piłsudski, Rozwadowski and others for two decades, the Polish state is no longer considered an exotic nation of barbarians that could not rule itself. 
Um, Jan Smoots, one of the founders of the United Nations, once uh, called Poles Kafirs or born slaves. Uh, whereas Lord Dubernan, whom I believe Eva mentioned at the beginning of this talk, of course, he called the Battle of Warsaw one of the most important battles of, um, in history. Lord Dubernan suggested that Poland should become an experimental arena where European armies would clash in the same way Africa was an experimental arena for European science. So in other words, what I'm getting to is that thanks to the triumph at Warsaw, Poland stops being considered a part of this colonial periphery of the West. And that's perhaps um, the significance of the Battle of Warsaw that we should pay more attention um, as this grand centennial celebration comes to a close. Uh, thank you, I, I think that would be all. So I know that uh, some of you might have any questions, so I will allow um, Eva to, to moderate the discussion. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Piotr, for a very informative and insightful and interesting presentation. I believe that you need to uh, like, uh, remove the screen sharing. Oh, yes, yes, I'm trying to. On your, I think, screen. Okay, so here we are back. Okay, so um, I can see that we received um, some questions which I will read uh, so as uh, they are known to everyone. So the first question we received is, the Polish military has been ridiculed in American and European media for decades. Uh, as inept, technologically inferior, and historically backward during World War II. Does the Battle of Warsaw demonstrate counter evidence to this nar narrative? Um, I'm not a military historian. Certainly, um, the military tactics of Piłsudski, Rozwadowski, um, and other Polish generals um, were proof that um, the Polish army was not um, inferior to the Western armies. Um, when we talk about the interwar period, I think that again, we should mention the work of the Polish cryptologists. Um, in the late 1930s, Rejewski, Ruzicki, and, um, and the third gentleman, whose name is me now, um, they actually devised a very elaborate um, machine uh, called Bomba uh, to, to decipher German, uh, German messages. So, um, so technologically speaking, maybe not the Polish military, but the Polish intelligence, the Polish military intelligence is, is very, um, very advanced. Um, so I hope that, that answers that question to some extent. I believe it does. Another question that uh, we received, uh, World War II historians point to Hitler's inner circle as unwilling to offer dissident opinions and build the case that he was ill-advised in invading Russia. Do historians see this battle as being ill-advised at that time? I don't believe so. Um, perhaps they see the Kiev offensive as ill-advised, but not the Battle of Warsaw. Well, it depends on which perspective we're talking about. Is advice on the part of the Soviets or advice on the part of the Poles? Perhaps you could argue that, again, the Soviets, um, the Bolsheviks, however you want to call them, uh, overextended their lines. So in that sense, the Battle of Warsaw was um, ill-advised or ill-devised. Ill um, However, again, I think the question needs a bit of uh, clarification to, to be answered more um, okay. uh, in more detail. So maybe we will be able to uh, return to it later. Um, another question that I received. Uh, Poland asserted itself military under P Piłsudski's rule. What effect did this victory and Piłsudski's war with Russia overall, overall have on Poland's standing internationally? Um, right away, they don't affect Poland's international standing um, as much as you would think. The British are irritated. Um, they don't immediately change their approach to Poland. Um, the French are also busy with their own problems. Um, in 1925, the Western powers signed the Locarno treaties, again, betraying Poland, um, um, this time in relation to the Germans. Uh, the Locarno treaties did not guarantee um, the stability of the Polish-German frontier. Um, 
In the long run, uh, the Battle of Warsaw and the Polish Bolshevik War um, um, in general uh, does have a great psychological effect on the Poles themselves. However, they um, perceive Poland as a great power, at least uh, gradually they come to that conclusion. And this has some effect on um, uh, Polish foreign policy in the 1930s, um, the foreign policy of um, Minister Józef Beck, for example. But um, again, this is a very long history and very, very complicated. So I'm not sure if, uh, um, if we should take time to, to elaborate on it. Perhaps we should uh, allow other questions to, to, be, to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we are, I'm sure we'll have other opportunities to elaborate on that more. Uh, another question uh, that we received, would Poland have succeeded against the Bolsheviks if there was a different Polish leader, not Piłsudski? What was his primary characteristic or talent that led to, this, to the victory? Huh. <laughs> another <laughs> uh, counterfactual history that um, <laughs> uh, no respectable historian <laughs> should indulge in. Well, that's not true, actually. Um, well, um, I, I don't want to replace Piłsudski with anybody in this alternative history. Um, I'd rather keep him. Um, but um, to, uh, to answer the, the part of the question uh, concerning characteristics, um, I think that Piłsudski's refusal to be concerned with the Western opinion was crucial. He understood uh, the psyche of the West. He understood that um, uh, Poland can only um, count on its own forces, can only count on its own will to survive. So um, I don't know what you would like to call this characteristic. Is it re um, relentlessness? Is it um, perseverance, um, stubbornness? Um, I, I think this was, uh, this was really crucial. Okay, thank you. And another question, does this history impact why the British and French did not declare war on the Soviet Union in 1939 when they invaded Poland, but declared war on Germany, which also invaded Poland? Oh, um, again, drawing these parallels between 1920 and 1939 um, is always tricky because the, the nitty gritty details change. The circumstances are slightly different. Yes, there was certainly some concern with domestic um, the politics in 1939 when France and Britain uh, refused to um, declare war on the Soviet Union. But overall, um, I think pragmatic reasons dictated, um, um, dictated uh, stood behind the decision. Um, Nazi Germany was such a great threat to, to France and Britain that declaring war on the Soviet Union would have been, uh, to use that word again, ill-advised um, from the perspective of these powers. Um, I, th I think appeasement, um, I think we can talk about um, an appeasement of the Soviet Union in 1945. Um, with the Yalta conference, but I think it's too early to talk about that still in 1939. Okay. Uh, thank you, and I believe we have time for one more, the last question, namely, Russia has reigned and dominated over Poland many times. Does this decisive victory of offer a moment of pause to contemporary Russian aggression against Poland? Uh, yes, certainly. The, the victory at Warsaw, the triumph at Warsaw, um, offers 20 years of respite to Poland and really to, to all of Europe, uh, especially to Eastern Europe. Uh, the Treaty of Riga signed in March 1921 um, is really a, a symbol of uh, Soviet-Russian failure to Sovietize Eastern Europe, to reconquer the lost Tsarist territory. Um, and it Katyn, for the genocide at Katyn can almost be seen as Stalin's revenge for uh, the Battle of Warsaw, for losing that great war um, that was supposed to sparkle um, the world revolution. Um, as you might recall from my talk, Stalin was the political commissar uh, with um, Budionny's cavalry army, and he really wanted to conquer Lvov, to take Lvov. Um, because he saw it um, as, as a frontier um, 
that would then lead to further a further um, military conquest and further spreading of the communist revolution. Uh, so again, Stalin definitely remembered Warsaw when he um, ordered or acquiesced to the murder of Polish officers in Katyn. So, uh, so this was, um, in a sense, um, this only delayed, the Battle of Warsaw only delayed, um, you might say, the inevitable, if you want to be fatalistic. However, it did allow the Polish nation to really form itself because 20 years is a long time. In 1918, you're you still talking about a divided Poland, um, people um, coming together, hailing from three different partitions, from three different cultural and political backgrounds. By 1939, um, they're a much more united nation um, than uh, they are in 1918. So these 20 years are really important. I think they, they decide about Poland becoming a Soviet satellite as opposed to an integral part of the Soviet Union um, after Yalta. Piotr, thank you very much once again for a very informative uh, presentation on My the pleasure. Very, very special occasion. Uh, thank you especially that you pointed the very beginning at the involvement of the United States in the Polish-Soviet War and also at the connection with the Kościuszka Foundation. Uh, it's very interesting, you know, to, to learn about that. Uh, thank you all who join us for this webinar and uh, we look forward to hosting you uh, during our upcoming webinars that will, will be, that will be presented during the fall. And uh, now I wish you all, I mean, great weekend and a wonderful last days of August. Thank you. Thank you so much. Likewise, stay healthy, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye.